And you all have seen me plenty of times. I'm Zaria, I use she, her pronouns, and... I'm Andrea, I use she, her pronouns, um, comms manager here at the national office. So today we are going to be able to participate in mock interviews, and we're delighted to have one of our team members with us, Carolyn, if you want to take a minute to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Aria. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Fennessy. I'm the Assistant Comms Director for PETA 12 at EdTrust. Um, and before I worked in comms, I was a journalist primarily covering education for about 10 years. Yeah, she's amazing. I'm very excited for that part. So we've already done introductions. Andrea is going to take us through um, conquering the media interview. And then we'll have a spokesperson panel from some of our EdTrust staff who have actually done plenty of media interviews and can provide you some tips. We'll do mock interviews and then we will wrap up at the end with some next steps and actions you can take um, in your advocacy journey. Andrea, take it away. Yeah, so it's really nice to see a lot of you that have been coming since our first training. If you haven't, um, that's okay. We'll catch you up. Um, but today's is focused specifically on media interviews as an advocacy tool. Um, and it's going to build off a little bit of what we talked about last session on how to craft effective messaging. Of course, we want you as well prepared as you can be for any media interview. And that um, involves having talking points, really strong ones that are effective and reaches your audience. So just want to make it clear on how media interviews can be an avenue for advocacy. As you know, um, you as the experts on the ground of what's happening in the classroom, you're able to share what's, ex what's actually happening in the classroom and your own experience as an educator. Um, it allows you to bring issues and solutions to the forefront that are impacting your school community and bring it to a broader audience's attention, which is always great, especially for those who might not really be in tune with what's happening in schools and in districts. Um, it allows you to also shift the narrative. You might see a lot of media being portraying things in a very deficit-based way or misconstruing some of the things that you might be experiencing. So it's a, a opportunity to shift the narrative. Um, and lastly, it allows you to advocate for change by calling out inequities at either a district, state, or national level, because as you know, there are several outlets, uh, whether that's national media, state media, local media, but all of them have uh, provide you an opportunity to advocate for your students and for issues that really matter to you. Um, and I do want to go over, it's a little bit of what we talked about last time, but obviously to conquer any media interview, you want to have um, really strong talking points and be as prepared as you can be. So even before entering a media interview, you want to make sure that whatever talking points you have drafted, that they touch on these three key elements, and that's knowing who your audience is, making an emotional connection, and making sure that your message is simple. So going into those a little bit more, um, your audience, who is it? Is it policymakers? Are you trying to reach teachers? Are you trying to speak mainly to families? What publications do they read? You know, a lot of us might have an interview, let's say with Education Week, how we speak to them might be very different to how we speak to a local reporter, let's say the Dallas Morning News. Education Week has, you know, an audience that's very in tune with what's happening in education. But if you're speaking to somewhere more locally, you might need to back away from some of the language you, you typically use in an education space and try to make it a little more approachable and meaningful. Um, and just know what your audience cares about. You always want to align your messaging with what they value and connect your values to your key messages. Um, and again, making an emotional connection is probably the best way to do that. So obviously, you want to make sure that whatever you're saying is factual and based in uh, data and evidence-based data. But you also want to, there's also a story behind the statistics. It's not just, you know, numbers that speak to people, it's stories and experiences. So don't be afraid to leverage your own story, leverage your own examples and experiences that might speak best to the issue that's brought up in an interview. 
Um, and using real stories of what you've seen in the classroom is really important because a lot of times reporters don't get that aspect um, when they're reporting on education issues. And then lastly, just make sure your message is simple. Um, I know a lot of times we get passionate and like to you know, go into things really deeply because we're really knowledgeable about it, but we, you don't have a lot of time and you often wanna keep it to a very short two to three sentences that answers the question. Um, get to your main idea and your advocacy point, what's your call to action. Um, and just remember, you want it to be quotable. Uh, we always tell people, think of what you would say in a tweet. Um, nowadays, I don't know how many characters that is on X, but you always want to make sure that it's short, uh, simple, and easy to remember. And you will also want to avoid any jargon. Um, you know, we love our acronyms in education, but we wanna make sure that we're making our language accessible to all students and families um, that might not be aware of what those acronyms and words might mean in that moment. So I'm gonna talk about one tactic you can use, and we touched on this last time, but a messaging triangle is just a really helpful tool to kind of help you get organized with your, with your thoughts and talking points. So a messaging triangle kind of um, builds off your core message. So what's the main value or belief that you have about a particular issue or a particular situation? So for example, your core message might be, all students deserve a physically safe and emotionally supportive school environment. If that's your leading message, you wanna make sure you have three key supporting messages that touch on that. And those three key messages defines the issue you wanna address, and it has to be specific, shares the impact it can have on students and school communities, and you have to have a call to action. What do you want your audience to do? So for example, all students deserve a physically safe and emotionally supportive school environment. What's the issue? It might be that students of color are being, you know, over uh, suspended at higher rates than their peers. What's the impact? The impact that can have is that really is detrimental to the student's sense of belonging and well-being. And what's the call to action? We need uh, policies and restorative practices in place to really um, ensure that we are not only um, solving some of the discipline issues at the root, but it's also enabling an environment that's positive and supportive and inclusive of all students. So you always want to make sure that those three key messages all kind of tie back into your core message. And of course, you always want to have the three S's to support those key messages. And those three S's are a story, a soundbite, and a statistic. What's a data point that's really going to stand out? And here's an example of one. What's a soundbite that can that that key message can be shared in a shorter way and what's a data point that's really going to bring it home or a, a story so here's an example of a completed one obviously you no know, this is a lot to remember but just having these written down and having something to pull out of your pocket in case something comes up and you need to reiterate a point that's always helpful um, and later on, you're going to hear from some of our spokespeople at EdTrust to kind of share, you know, ways that they, um, tips and tricks that they use when they're interviewing, because a lot of times, you know, it can be scary in a moment when you're not expecting a question to be thrown at you. But this messaging triangle really helps you ground in these key messages so that whenever you're thrown a question that you might not be expecting, you can always bring it back to one of these um, key and core messages. All right, so conquering the media interview, before we have our mock reporter kind of uh, share a little bit and show what a um, media interview, that a nailed me media interview looks like, there's a few things you wanna keep in mind. So obviously for any interview, you wanna avoid this and you wanna do this. So. Obviously, we don't want to be Michael Scott, who, you know, is going off the cuff and just, you know, sharing what's on his mind. 
You want to go in prepared and feeling like you can control and drive the conversation because that's exactly what you are doing. You're in the driver's seat and you're the one who drives the conversation no matter what question they throw at you. So it is about practice, just like any of us learning a new sport or hobby or activity for the first time. It can be intimidating at first, but you always want to continue practicing and ensuring that you have your talking points right. Um, so practice using the messaging triangle with peers, practice using it in front of the mirror, speak loudly. You want to make sure you're energetic, shoulders back, smiling. Um, and just practicing redirection. It's always good to role play, especially with peers and other people who might also be doing an interview um, and have them pose questions to you that might pop up in an er interview so that you can prepare for those types of questions. And here are just three ways that you might uh, see um, kind of something thrown your way. You can be given bad information, you can be thrown speculation, or you might be thrown an irrelevant question. So all of these are just meant to kind of throw you off or have wanting you to repeat the same bad information that they give you. But one tool and tactic that's really helpful is to use bridging statements. So bridging statements are just meant to kind of connect um, whatever question they throw at you, connect it back to your messaging and key points. So if there's ever a question that is not even related to what the topic is about or is a or has multiple questions, remember you don't have to answer that question directly. You can always bring it back to what you want to talk about. So for example, let's say the interview is about um, you know, discipline policies in DC. Um, and they ask you something about what do you think, or do you think all cops should be, you know, taken out of schools or, um, you know, what is it? Um, do you think we should abolish all, you know, police in general? If you don't want to answer that inflammatory question directly, Again, always bring it back to your talking points. Um, I find right now that the more important issue is to, or um, what matters most in the situation is this, always bring it back to what you're actually talking about, which is what's affecting students and ways that you can solve that issue. So those are just a few bridging statements to keep in mind um, that would be helpful to have in your back pocket. Um, but again, you're driving the conversation. You don't have to answer directly the question that is given to you. You can always bring it back to what you want to talk about. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our spokespeople who have had a lot of um, experience with media interviews. You know, Sandra, has um, recently been in the media and Kristen has, um, since she started, has just constantly been in different forms of media as well. So would love to hear from them. We have three questions we have for them ready, but obviously we'll keep it a little bit open for y'all to ask questions if you're curious about anything. Um, but Kristen and Sandra, I can let you, um, kind of share a little bit about yourselves before posing these three questions, if that's okay. Uh, hi, I'm Kristen. Um, I, I'm a policy analyst and I lead our work on college and career readiness on our P12 policy team. Hi everyone, my name is Sandra Perez. I'm a higher ed research analyst to work with a lot of data that consists of um, accessibility to colleges and um, cost of attendance. Thank you both. I have my first question for you both um, and can go in any order. In your opinion, what role can interviews play in advocacy or advocating for students? I can go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, 
So advocating for students, you know, I think sometimes there's this wall that comes up for students that they can't advocate for themselves, right? It's, sometimes it's hard for them to, to advocate for themselves. Um, there's some barriers that are put up that, you know, they might not be aware of. Um, but, you know, as since um, at a trust, well, a lot of our um, co-workers have lived these experiences that a lot of students are living through. Um, so we know their experiences, so we can talk from our experiences, what might work, what might not work. Um, and, you know, you guys are the experts. You guys have seen, you guys are in the field. You've seen um, what students struggle with, what things they excel at. Um, and it's important to be advocates um, in every sense, right? So when doing these interviews, it gives us a huge chance to be able to talk for them um, when sometimes they might not be able to talk for themselves. I would just add to everything Sandra said um, that I think often when I speak to journalists or reporters, I'm either trying to shine light on an issue or maybe even speak towards why a certain policy or a change may be needed. And usually the people who are making those decisions are so far away from the classroom or students or teachers themselves. And so I feel like we get a chance to provide the why of what these stories are doing or what these policies could be doing or why there needs to be a change. So in, in mine and Sandra's case, that may be you know, sharing data or research or context, but, or stories, you know, especially when teachers can share stories, I think that makes the context so much more human, which is so deeply needed for so many folks who are making decisions about education. And uh, we want to contribute to a narrative to get other people to care too and help them understand a complicated issue. And I think one thing that's been helpful to me, I care a lot about access to advanced coursework. I'm deep in the policy there. And I talked to a reporter who, read, who wrote a great story about uh, after talking to me and a bunch of other people. And the headline was so simple. Kids are probably better at math than they think. A new Texas law could help them realize it. And I was like, ah, oh, she just distilled like work I do all day, every day into an understandable headline. Anyone could read and be like, yeah. So we get to contribute to people being like, okay, what might that policy be? And why should I care about that? Thank you both. Um, I have a second question for you all related to kind of when you first started uh, taking on media interviews, because, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of you maybe just started interviewing about a year or a year and a half ago. Um, so my second question to you all is, how did you overcome your fear or initial emotions of being interviewed? I think um, in my case, um, I got very nervous at first because I'm a very numbers oriented person and that sometimes is difficult to communicate to others in a way that doesn't make them make their eyes gloss over. So um, I was really nervous that I wouldn't be able to get my message across in that way. But thankfully, you know, with some training, I was able to, um, you know, talk about my message. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I think once I, you know, got into the rhythm of talking to people about like the work that I'm very passionate about, it became a lot easier to talk about it. Um, and one thing that I learned is that the media tech, a lot of times asks the same question over and over. So you don't really have to think about the question too much after it's asked maybe once or twice then you kind of already know what you want to say, how you want to say things. So it gets easier over time. Yeah, I agree with that. And I still for sure get nervous, you know, every time and I get nervous, you know, I'm worried I'll mess up or forget something or not know what to say. But 
of course, my answer to that is prepare, like not sexy, but I seriously prepare because I get so nervous. And then I feel like I can be myself once I've put in the work. Um, so that's my, that helps me overcome my fear. But also Andrea mentioned making an emotional connection. I've realized even if I'll add a personal story or a personal story that I know of, I feel like reporters love those. And as teachers, you probably have a lot of those in your pockets. So those stories that can make issues come alive are gold. And um, hopefully those are things that you that you can bring from yourself and the opportunity to just be yourself. Thank you both. Um, and I think you've already given really great advice and tips, but want to further ask what other tips do you have for really nailing an interview? I can, I can share some more, you know, I already mentioned I prepare. I really prep like crazy. I even handwrite like answers that I think that they might ask about or my, I like what, I really like what Andrea said about like what it'd say in a tweet that just helps. It's like where I can always come back to, you know, something that I just have. And that takes, it takes a lot of practice. I say it out loud before I talk to someone, I like talk to them, my dog about what I think they might ask. Um, also I research what the journalist has written on previously. So I know what they care about. Um, and kind of their angle on things. And I find that's really helpful to me. It can also make me feel a little bit safe. Like I have a feeling the journalist and I kind of care about this in a similar way. Um, I'm not a afraid to ask them to repeat the question or rephrase it. And also like Andrea mentioned earlier, I'm definitely not afraid to get pulled where I don't wanna go. I've said, I don't know before, you know, and I'm like, that's not my wheelhouse. Like I'm not gonna answer that question or I do my best politician and it feels a little wild, but veer back to something you do want to talk about as artificial as it feels, you're in control, like you are in the driver's seat. So I think once you do that once, it feels like more natural to do that. Yeah. And to Kristen, your point about, you know, getting to know your reporter, um, I think that's really important, especially um I've had two separate interviews, one with a reporter that was very like data heavy researcher background, you know, so we could talk easily. Um, whereas I had another who wasn't really super in, in the education space, who, you know, wasn't super number heavy. And, you know, I, I definitely had to learn how to shift my language in, in those two ways. So definitely getting to know your reporter is a big one. Thank you both. And you both touched on something that's really important. And I hope we also touch later down the line is just knowing what your reporters are reporting on and, you know, reading some of their past pieces, building a relationship with them, which will be our fifth webinar <laughs> that you can join. Um, but it's just so important to know, um, Kind of like they said, having a relationship with them um, and understanding the way that they're thinking about things um, so you know what to expect a little bit. Um, but thank you both. I'm going to kind of stop here before letting you go and would love to hear from anyone who has like additional questions or very specific questions to both of our spokespeople on just interviews and nailing interviews. When people reach out to you for interviews, do they have like a specific topic in mind or um, do they start with like a little bit more of an open-ended intention? Carolyn, I feel like I can bump it to you, right? Yeah, please. Um, so yeah, they should reach out to you and say, I'm writing a story on this voucher program, on the new proposal to put cops at school, take cops out of school, whatever it is. And you can always, when you start the interview, just say to them, hey, could you tell me a little bit about your story? Who else you're planning to talk to? You know, what kind of, you know, 
uh, views you're going to take into it, that kind of stuff. Um, if you ever get someone who emails you and just says, can I interview you? You should ask them some follow-up questions for sure. I also had a question. Um, I know you're talking about people reaching out to you, but do you reach out to certain outlets or seek out, you know, people that are talking about the topics that you're interested in and usually what's the feedback or the follow-up with that? This is me again. Um, we're a little bit different because we have a whole communication staff that, you know, myself and my colleagues do that um, for, for our wonderful team. I would say if you're in a school district or you're working with other organizations and you really have a topic that you want to speak out on, let them know because they're the ones who are going to be fielding inquiries from journalists of like, you know, somebody calls a school district and says, I would really love to talk to, you know, a first grade teacher about the science of reading. And if you meet that qualification and your school district knows it, that's super helpful for everybody. These are very good questions. I have a, a question. So when thinking about in the moment when you are in an interview um, and you get asked one of those, like, I don't want to answer questions and you're really kind of caught off guard, how do you save face in the moment to allow yourself the time to pause and think without coming across as like, trying to shift the conversation back or to avoid because then they will come back and be like, no, I actually asked you this question. <laughs> so how do you in that moment respond in a way that's still professional, but still do what you want to do? I can jump, I've, I've been in that situation before. And I think Andrea's previous slide may have been the bridging words. And I just think I have one like, I actually think what's really important is this. And like I said, it feels, it feels awkward, but to me, you know, when I've done that, they haven't pushed me back. I think they get that. I'm like, I'm not really interested in talking about that thing. I'm going to hit back on something I've already told you. I feel like I'm still being professional and trying to kind of almost drawing a line of like, this is more where I want to be. So I, I feel like it actually happens like fairly regularly in an interview but usually it's quickly diffused for me. Yeah, I'll also say if you get one of those questions that's sort of three or four questions in one, you can pick one to answer and then say, I know you asked me a couple other things. Can you remind me what those were? Or Carolyn, wouldn't you even say, sometimes like if I'm asked multiple questions in one, I answer the one I want to answer. And then yeah. I don't answer the ones I don't want to sure. answer. And usually they don't, push me on that because I answered it in the way that I wanted to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if it's not something like if you're not on live TV, you can say like, huh, that's a really interesting question. Let me think about that for a second. Like you can take a beat. No one's going to be like answer me, me immediately. Right. Unless they're a real jerk. Can I also add one that makes me think one thing that I I I find interesting is often when I'm doing interviews as well, they'll leave space at the end. Is there anything you wanted to talk about? You know, that we didn't talk about yet, which I'm always like, I ooh, now that that's happened to me a couple of times, I usually prepare for with my talking points are in front of me right on my computer. Yes, I wanted to make sure and share this data point or this thing that you didn't ask me about. It just gives me one more open door to try to steer it in a way of something I think important. Now, I don't feel like they usually include that in their piece, but um, that regularly does happen to me as well. Yeah, that's sort of a best practice in journalism because like you wanna, you have the idea that you will get all your answers with your questions, but you won't always. Um, so most journalists worth their salt should end with, is there anything else that I didn't ask you that I should know about? Is there anybody else I should talk to? Something like that. Do they usually send you the questions ahead of time so that you're able to like prepare for them? And if 
that is not a norm, could you make it so that you don't do the interview unless you have the questions beforehand? So they probably won't. That's not a standard in journalism. You can ask them, right? If they say they want to talk about literacy, you can say, okay, well, like what parts of literacy do you want to talk about? You can ask them for some more specific kind of like topics, but they're not going to send you the questions ahead of time now. If uh, there are no more questions, and we'll save space for time at the end if you have more questions, we actually have time for you all to do a practice mock interview with a media spokesperson. Um, so we'll put all the things that we just learned into practice. Um, so uh, thinking back to everything we just learned, um, what you wanna keep in mind is it is not okay to have an immediate response. You can ask to repeat the question again. You can take a moment to say, let me think about that. And always remember your main talking points and what's important to you. As teachers, like Kristen shared, you have plenty of amazing stories and real stories um, that you can highlight. So don't be afraid to share those and get personal. And remember to be the driver of your interview and don't let the reporters steer where they want to go, focus on your North Star and keep everything short and simple. Try not to go um, on a ramble like uh, Mr. Scott. Um, we are going to, I think, start off with an example from Kristen. I think. I promise. I'm down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so usually when we um, help staff prepare for these, myself or a colleague will put on our, um, most of us were reporters at one point, put on our reporter hats, ask some questions, um, have our colleague answer, and then give some feedback um, on their answer to help them prepare. Um, so Kristen, what's the best way to ensure equity in advanced coursework? That's a great question. And at EdTrust, we believe all students deserve access to rigorous, engaging coursework. But too often, students are not equally accessing advanced coursework opportunities in their schools. We believe that it's really important that students experience a sense of belonging in their advanced classes. It's not enough for access. Students must also experience a welcoming environment where they can receive reach success in their course as well. I'll pause there. Okay, sure. So the way I phrased that, I think I was expecting her to say automatic enrollment or more AP classes or something but she went back and made sure that I knew the broader scope of things and what kind of the background of the problem was. Um, so that's definitely a way that you can do that uh, if you encounter such a thing. Um, okay, so uh, Kristen, Black and Latino students routinely get lower test scores than white and Asian students. Won't it like do more harm than good to throw them in advanced classes if they're not ready for it? So. We have really important data that shows that Black and Latino students are successful in advanced courses when given the opportunity. Too often they're shut out of advanced courses because of barriers like racialized tracking in schools or um, counselor, counselor and teacher biases that may keep them from accessing their courses. So no, actually the data shows that students are successful and what we need to do is make sure that we're opening the door for students and giving them the supports to be successful once they're in those classes. Yeah, right. She just absolutely demolished the entire premise of my question, which was appropriate, right? <laughs> so don't be afraid to like go hard on someone if their question is just out of pocket or they might not always phrase it that way. They might be like, critics say X, Y, Z, or this politician says, you know, whatever. Um, okay. Um, so Kristen, a couple years ago, the San Francisco school district in an effort to promote equity stopped any students from taking algebra in the eighth grade? Um, why was that a bad idea? So 
So we know that students are not accessing algebra in eighth grade equitably across the country. And San Francisco was trying to speak to longstanding disparities in access, but by removing acceleration, they were ultimately harmed students. So we found out from recent data released by the school board that actually fewer Black and Latino students were accessing advanced coursework in high school, showing that the effort, which in theory was grounded in equity, did not result in what the district was hoping for. At the end of the day, we actually don't have data that suggests that that practice is helpful for students. So while districts will continue to accelerate students in middle school, we must ensure that districts are accelerating students equitably. Yeah, that was great. And you gave them a, the benefit of the doubt, which is nicer than I probably would have been in your shoes. Um, okay, last question. And this is an example, right, of like, you might get an uh, uh, interview request on one topic and then somebody's gonna come in and ask you something else. Um, so Kristen, you also do work on advancing career pathways and it's, right, I think everyone would agree it's good to open more options for more students. A four-year degree isn't for everyone. But how do we make sure that we don't go back to a system that we had in decades past where some students, mostly students of color, were sort of relegated to lesser career training programs while other students were set up for college? We need to make sure that all students are being prepared for college and career opportunities. So school, it's the school's job to prepare students for a variety of pathways that exist in front of them, but schools must be preparing students to access and reach college opportunities, as well as whichever career pathways they're interested in. That means strong data collection to ensure we know where students are, which path students are accessing and what their outcomes are, and regularly looking at that data to ensure that students are accessing pathways equitably. Now, at the end of the day, if we know that the four-year college degree may give students the best opportunity in life, districts must ensure that they're preparing students to access those opportunities if that's the path they want to go down. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Exactly on the hot seat. Um, okay. That was great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions based on that example? So I really benefited from listening to that and I thought it was very informative um, just from my perspective and seeing what that looks like. But I do have a question about just the content. I think um, like when Kristen was giving her messaging, like that messaging that she was trying to get across was super clear. Um, but I like on my end, and maybe I'm thinking about stuff outside of media, but I don't feel like it, there were very specific action steps instead of a specific message. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Is that something the media needs to hear from us? Like, do they need action steps or should we just focus on the message? Sure. I think it's not either or, right? It's, you know, students need equitable learning environments and we get that by whatever, you know, particular policy you want to advocate. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, it's one or the other. Right. And so like when, in my first question, when I said sort of like, how do we get access, equitable access to advanced coursework, Kristen gave me a great background. If it was a real interview, I might've followed up with like, okay, great, but how do we do that? And then she could have slid in with, you know, some specific policy recommendations. So now that y'all have seen an example, um, it is time for a brave soul to give it a try. Like we said, the best way to prepare is to practice. Um, so who would like to be the first volunteer? And Caroline has prepared some teacher friendly questions. Oh, okay. I was like, yeah, are, do we know what we're going to be asked? I don't mind <laughs> starting. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and could you tell me, Sarah, what you teach and where you are? I, I, li I live in Nashville, Tennessee, but I teach in Brentwood High School Spanish. Okay. All right. High School Spanish, yeah. Um, 
So Sarah, federal COVID aid is running out in September and we know a lot of schools are gonna have to cut funding. Um, what kind of impacts are you concerned about at your school? Federal income is going to be limited. So I think first and foremost, we received a lot of money and assistance with technology. And so making sure that we have enough money and support tech support for our students um, to be able to still manage on a laptop that's either issued or given and the maintenance through out middle or high school and particularly for all four years and giving them those same opportunities as students that have the resources to maintain their technology at home, you know, whether it be hotspots, whether it be a working Chromebook or chargers. So I think that's the first concern, should I keep going? Because I have more. Sure. <laughs> well, and then um, we also received a lot of money for um, just a lot of social, emotional, and a lot of DEI um, programs. And so making sure that some of those programs that were piloted and started and supported during the pandemic and post-pandemic are still have legs to grow and to function and not be, you know, really severed um, because of funding. So trying to find creative grants or ways to um, keep those programs in-house would be another concern. Okay. Um, I think those are great. My only um, comment would be maybe talk about what having those means for your students, right? Because like, I think a lot of people would think like, okay, well, you know, the kids are back in the school building. Like, why do they need the computers anymore? And right, SEL and DEI can be kind of like wishy-washy things for people who are not in the thick of this, um, right? So whether that, right, that might be as simple as like, my students still have a lot of like mental health challenges after the pandemic and we have these great programs and they've succeeded and I'm really worried about them being cut. Yeah. So, okay. All right, Andrea, should I keep going with Sarah or does somebody else wanna come up to the plate? Sarah, if you're up for round two, but we could also keep it open to someone else who would like to also give it a first attempt. I'll give it a first attempt. Okay. Um, and it, can you tell me what you teach and where, please? Um, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm actually a, a curriculum specialist, so I don't teach. Okay. Okay. Um, so legislators in a lot of places, including Tennessee, um, are proposing to expand education savings accounts or vouchers or other publicly funded private school choice programs. What do you think about these? Um, so I think it's important that um, all students have mm -hmm. access to education that meets their needs and so that they have opportunities to go where they, they need to. And I'm a jump out of character for a second. I don't know much about this, so I'm just giving an answer as if I had done research and just answer. Um, so if I'm quoting things incorrectly, it is probably true. Um, but I think that kids need to have access to um, opp uh, opportunities. And so if the voucher programs will allow for all students to be able to go to schools um, that perform better and allow them to do uh, or learn what they need to, then I think it's a great program. However, if it is going to further uh, discriminate or um, wedge a gap between the haves and the have nots, then I think it's going to eventually do a disservice to our students. And that's not what we want for all of our kids. Okay. Yeah, I think for something that you didn't know a lot about, that was a great answer. Um, so I can give you an easier one. Um, what do you wish um, your elected officials knew about your school and what's happening there that they don't? Uh, so I would like for our the legislators to know that 
our students and our families care about their education. So I teach in a school um, that typically may be deemed as low performing. Uh, parents don't care about their kids. Kids are disrespectful. They can't learn. They have too many gaps. But that's not the case. I have high parent engagement. They come, they sit in classes, they're at parent teacher conferences, they're emailing teachers. So to, to make a blanket statement around uh, the type of students or families that we serve is a disservice. Um, our parents want our kids to learn, their kids to learn, and our kids want to learn. And so I would want for you to understand that we all care and we're all in this doing the work. Um, and we just need your support uh, by providing us with the needed resources so that we can meet the mark that you're asking us to meet. Um, and what do you need additional resources for? So um, the new TISA funding bill that has come down the pipeline is a great um, revamp of uh, funding for education. And so there is a part of that that I think could be revised. And so one of the um, funding weights is on economic disadvantage. Now, um, many of our students are economically disadvantaged. They need support there. However, our kids aren't able to benefit from that because unfortunately they may not live with a custodial parent. And so they lose out on that weight funding source because we can't prove that they are on a SNAP benefit case or um, are, are economically disadvantaged. So one type of support that we would need from you all is to add in uh, multiple eligibility requirements for that weight. And so one of them could be eligibility in 10 care because that follows you no matter what household you're in or um, being able to be on free or reduced lunch because that also follows you. And so while the TISA funding is a great start, something that could be helpful for us to be sure that we get the adequate funding that we need is add an extra layer to that funding weight. That was great. You very clearly laid out the problem and how they can fix it. My only note would be, I didn't know what TISA meant and I'm a real nerd. So like, okay. you know, just watch. <laughs> Watch your acronyms. We know we love them in education. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for maybe one more. Um, and we can open it up to someone who hasn't gone um, or bring it back to someone who would like to have a second try, but just want to give the space for one more person to go. I can give it a try. Okay. Great. Um, and can you tell me what you teach and where? I teach middle school math in rural South Carolina. Okay. All right. Um, so we know middle school is a time of a lot of emotions. Um, social emotional learning weirdly has been tied um, to CRT and other right kind of like allegedly woke education efforts. Um, what kind of social emotional practices do you do with your students and how are they working? So social emotional learning definitely has a lot of identities associated with it when it comes to DEI, CRT, and a lot of different labels. But what I think is really important is middle schoolers are at that stage where they're really identifying, you know, who they belong with, um, who they are, and really defining themselves in terms of their relationships with their peers. And so in my classroom, social emotional learning is both something that is taught as a curriculum um, during the advisory period that we have, but also it is taught and embedded into the group work that students do in math classes or how they interact with their peers during study hall. And so I think it's very important to remember that we, when we're teaching social emotional learning, it's just part of how we interact with students and how students interact with each other. And you can see the difference in our students um, a lot of students and parents, when they come to my school in particular, speak a lot about the differences in experience and how much more they are heard at the school, simply because we're a social emotional school, rather than some of the schools in the surrounding areas. Okay, that was great. 
Um, you did not get too trapped up in my, right, linking it to CRT, like you, right, mentioned it, you totally could have totally ignored that. Um, but otherwise, I think you drew a really good um, parallel in a thing that like, my sister teaches middle school English, and I did not even consider that like, group work is social emotional learning, but of course it is, right? Um, and then I think a follow up question that you might get to that would be, like, what does being a social emotional school mean? Like, what does that designation mean? Um, that would probably be my next follow up to that. So. Okay. Do you want me to answer that or? Sure. If you want, I know we're, we're close to time. Um, yeah, we might be close I to think time. just, um, like uh, just something to keep in mind as you're answering, mm -hmm. like think about what the next question that's going to prompt is. Thank y'all for engaging with that. And Carolyn, thank you for helping us through this. Um, we will share the slide deck with you all that has more tips on how to know the interview um, that you can go through on your spare time um, and continue to practice these skills with your pet at home or in the mirror um, because practice will make perfect. So um, we have a few next steps for you all. Um, Andrea, I have not, don't know about this opportunity. <laughs> um, just some next steps as we wrap up. Things to consider is we talked a lot about, you know, knowing who your reporter is and a good way to build relationships. And we'll touch on this on our in our fifth webinar, but want to touch on it really quickly here. Writing a blog and an op-ed for a media outlet is a really good way to start building that relationship. Tweeting at them and following them on social media is also a great way. Um, reaching out and grabbing a coffee also, just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I know that seems also intimidating, but you know, um, we learned today shooting your shot is always the best way. Um, and then just one opportunity I wanted to share, also shared by like ProPublica, um, they're always looking to hear from, you know, experts on the ground. Um, and this is just one way you can do that and, you know, uh, tag yourself as a spokesperson that can speak to some of the issues they might be reporting on. So that's just one um, quick way to start maybe engaging in, you know, as a spokesperson and influencing narrative in media. Um, and Zario will talk about a few other opportunities with EdTrust. Um, this one was actually a great opportunity brought up by Anjali um, and hope y'all take advantage of it. Um, but it's an EdSurge Voices of Change Writing Fellowship, uh, another way for you as teachers and experts on the ground to kind of get started on your writing um, and just have an opportunity to share through that medium. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll also drop the link in the chat and Zaria will share a few ed trust opportunities that you can engage in. Yes, um, a new opportunity ed trust is having a listening session for educators for you to provide your thoughts on three year assessments. Um, Emily Young is actually on from our team if you have any questions about this opportunity. Um, and she can provide a little bit more background information. Sure, thanks, Aria. Hi, y'all. Thanks for letting me join your space for a second. Um, I was able to catch the left a little bit, and everyone seems awesome, and, like, they could be great spokespeople. Um, so really excited about this work. Um, just wanted to share an opportunity for um, you all to be spokespeople, not necessarily nationally, but within EdTrust itself. Um, we are thinking about starting a new body of work on through year assessments. So assessments that would happen um, throughout the year instead of one huge assessment at the end of the year um, for these are state level assessments. So an assessment that would be broken up throughout the year um, instead of that one end of year state assessment. Um, and we wanna get your thoughts on um, whether this is a type of assessment program that you think might work better for your students, what issues you might have for it, what questions it raises for you. We're really trying to understand what this would look like in practice and whether or not it would be a value add for students. 
Um, we're going to be publishing a piece on this in the next few months or so, and we really would love um, some guidance and input um, from you all in, as to how we kind of shape that piece and what we, we end up advocating for as an organization to states across the country when it comes to assessments. So if you're interested, I'm happy to talk more about it personally. I'll drop my email in the chat, um, but there's also an interest form that I'll drop in the chat too. Um, and then we can set up some time to chat as a group. Um, and we are still working it out, but we're hoping to be able to um, provide some compensation as well, since y'all's time is valuable and your thoughts are valuable and you deserve to be compensated for that. So I'll keep you posted there, but I'll drop the relevant information in the chat and thanks for considering it. Thanks, Emily. Um, another opportunity, we are still seeking um, uh, feedback and thoughts on censorship and any relevant information on that within your estate. So you can scan the QR code or also when you get the slide deck, um, click on the link here. And of course, our next training session will be April 15th. So please be sure to register and the topic will be on how to leverage your social media for advocacy. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We're always glad to have you engage with their session. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Andrea or I.